an incredible turnaround it, it was there was no magical moment that allowed Diamond Creek to win there was no this no this godsend remarkable performance which turned the game around it was just good batting just just clicks into a new gear we were disappointed with how they were batting for a long period and then something they just clicked into place and they just started scoring much better and they were able to chase this target down in the end, it was uh, it almost became comfortable. Well, probably not quite as comfortable as uh, as you would have thought. They came towards the end there, but look, redemption certainly is the case there. Obviously, this is a new season, new opportunities there for Diamond Creek, and not necessarily a full strength side as we talked about earlier in the coverage. But the fact is, they got the right players to get the job done. Players play their role, and of course, they have the man that we'll talk about a little bit later who uh, did the job with bat and ball. Um, who will certainly feature in our forest, but we won't spoil who that is, we'll have a look at that a little bit later on. Absolutely, and you can see the two players are shaking hands. You can say both teams and all 22 players, not just both players. <laughs> <laughs> both teams of players are shaking hands, and so there is the Diamond Creekians. And someone is uh, laughing, but here is a Diamond Creek huddle. The, the red caps, or as uh, no one calls them. I don't think that doesn't change either. I would not like to see that happen. But look, it was a fantastic contest there. We'll obviously run through some more details about the scorecard just a little bit later on there, but um, probably a good team building one. When you get one of those close wins earlier in the year, it's self set up the season there. Suddenly they can think they can beat anyone, and that sort of confidence can take you a long way. Absolutely. And so they're just having a little huddle here. And over on further a bit away, the Riversideans, the Premiers from last season, who went undefeated with 13 wins from 14 contests, have suffered a defeat here. Like I don't. I don't know what they would be. They would be thinking. They would want to have established a really good foundation for this season. Well, when you have a look at the players who performed today, they're the same players as the players who performed in the grand final. When you look at uh, Gedge with the ball, and you look at um, with the bat, they had the same 
guys. You had the guys like Brooker, uh, Bragg, as well as Gedge. So they're the same guys that are doing well. It was just Diamond Creek did, did certainly play as a team there and, and had that fight in them when the thing odds were against them there. When the run rate seemed a little bit too far of hand, they then kept it in check. Okay, so we're going to take a break and then we're going to come back and we're going to have the post-match wrap-up. You are watching Channel 8, 24-hour sports network. Round 1 of the 2017-18 season, Diamond Creek versus Riverside. It is over. Diamond Creek won in the final over. We'll see you soon for the wrap-up. Cause it goes to bed at nine I don't want to be in Bowling Green Because it's plastered all the time I don't want to be in Lima Cause there's nothing there to do I just want to spend some time with you I don't want to be in Cincy Cause it smells like burning tires I don't want to be in Cleveland Cause the lake will catch on fire Without a 22, I just want to spend some time with you. Oh, well, it's so damn hard to find a reason to stay in this infuriating place. But it's hard to stay. In the early morning dew I just want to spend some time with you I don't want to be in London Cause the skies are always grey I don't want to be in Paris Cause I don't parlay no français Okay, so the Diamond Creek huddle has come to an end and they're slowly wandering off the pitch. And so, hey Dos, it's time to just run through the Diamond Creek innings. They were ch uh, chasing a total of 149, which is what Riverside set them. And uh, they had 40 overs to chase down and they chased down the last over. They certainly did there. It all began with the opening partial, which did only last to the third over there before Mitch Elzink uh, took the outside edge and was caught well by Johns off the bowling of Lewis for one. Followed then by a, a good partnership between Levine and Williams there. Accumulated 34 mostly through Williams. Levine being the next man to go there, being Morgan's first victim there. Out for 13 being caught there. Williams then was to fall in the big wicket there. Mistiming a pull shot straight to square leg when we thought that was the delivery 
would, you would get away with. He was the second highest score of the innings with 29. And at that point, 3 for 61, and we all thought certainly up here in the commentary box that Riverside had the edge. Then came the 46 run partnership between McDonald and Taylor before Mitch McDonald there going after the bowling there was caught. Sorry, it was actually clean bowl, my apologies. Clean bowl, stump removal uh, off the bowling of Connor Gedge for 24 there. Then came the important partnership between Dale Wells and Taylor, who put on 37 in quick fire time there. Came together in the 33rd over and went out in the 39th over. So six overs for 37 runs on this ground. Certainly sums it up there. Wells was then caught off the bowling of Connor Gedge for 28 there, going after the bowling there, as you have to in the final overs. Before Taylor did the same thing the very next ball there. So he fell for 34 and was the Ings top scorer. For at the end, Calvin Sexton not out four with a boundary to fine, fine leg. And Josh Merritt with four, quick over mid wicket there. Diamond Creek finishing 6 for 152, thanks to the contribution of 14 extras. If you have a look now at the bowling figures, uh, Lewis did a job early on that was quite tidy, but ended up finishing 7.2 overs, 1 for 32. Connor Gedge was the lean wicket taker, but probably not my pick of the bowlers there. 3 for 36 off 8. Woodcock did a handy job, but still went for 30 off his 8. No breakthroughs. Morgan, the pick of the bowlers in my opinion, 2 for 24 off 8. We also had Mills, 4 overs for 13. A tiny little uh, contribution there. And finally Dalton, 5 overs for 18. So. All up, the Riverside didn't do a particularly poor job. I think if that was in the first innings, they would then back themselves to make the run chase. But when you're back first, you actually have to keep them under the score that you made. Mmm, that is how cricket is played. That is how cricket is played. So, so Jerry, I, I want to get your thoughts there. Do you think uh, Skipper Doyle was perhaps a bit too reluctant to change his strategy throughout the afternoon? It's a difficult one. Like I said during the telecast that the best captains are the ones who remain emotionally um, neutral as possible, trying to take the good with the bad in the same light, so that you always back the, the percentages. You always say, we're going to win seven times or eight times out of ten, so I'm just going to back the numbers and hope that it plays out. And so, but there's a difference there. Um, you, you still have to as a captain relate to what is happening in context in order to make sure that what you are doing actually has the most impact on events. The intervention of the captain in terms of changing the shape and course of a match is something that is uh, never, uh, never to be underestimated. And uh, so throughout the mid-20 overs period where Diamond Creek was scoring at about three runs and over, the required run rate jumped up to six and he was using the technique of the smother. I think that he was doing the right thing and he was holding his whole, holding his own because he knew that this was the right thing to do. But then by about by about the 30th over mark when the Diamond Creekians were starting to shift that required run rate from six to five and especially there was that big over where a couple of boundaries were scored and that really changed the whole context of the match. That is the moment when you have to make a decision of what to do. And I feel like um, he didn't, he, I mean, he didn't do the wrong thing. He, he never did something disastrous, but the fact that he didn't figure out what Diamond Creek was actually doing. He didn't catch on until it was too late. He seemed to almost be lulled into a state of security. And then by the time he actually woke up, he suddenly, oh my gosh, we're actually behind in this game. And so if anything, when that big over happened, where those big runs were scored, that was the time when you just say, okay, Diamond Creek are starting to wriggle out of their chains. It's time to slap them back down. And that's when you really got to say, I'm going to bring out my best bowlers. I'm going to bring the field in and I'm going to stop this comeback from happening before it starts. That is the only thing you could possibly criticize him for. And that is just stretching your imagination because as far as like, because you, you can't know in, you know, hindsight is a great thing, but you can't know beforehand whether or not a comeback is actually real or it is just a suicidal surrender through slogging. And so the fact that he held his own could be considered, you know, a legitimate strategy. I, I'm not going to criticise him, but, but his team lost. It is understandable, but I, I honestly do think maybe he, he'd worked out 
who's going to bowl the overs before the game happened. That's the way I saw it. The fact that you had Gedge and Lewis only bowl at the start and at the end seemed like this was worked out prior, that he knew who was going to bowl beforehand, which is not always a bad thing, but sometimes as a captain you've got to think of the moment, go by feeling there. Maybe there was an opportunity to bowl Lewis or Gedge earlier and maybe back someone like a Mills or a Woolcock to bowl those F-overs instead there, have faith in the change bowler. So the only thing I would have done is that maybe Bull would have bought one of them, not necessarily both, one of them back. Gedge only bowled four overs in his first spell. Maybe there was an opportunity for him to bowl two and two in two different spells there. Get a couple of uh, overs in when the mcdonald taylor partnership was starting to come together. So that, that did come to mind for me. All right, well, so we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back with the votes for the Channel 8 Player of the Year. So don't go away. We're just going to be taking a quick break and then we'll be back and we'll wrap up the broadcast. This is Channel 8. Everything, everything, everything I touch will break And every day, every day, every day you give and I take I'm living the best that I can But fate never followed my plans I'm holding you back so I want you to pack up and grow Okay, and we're back here. This is the Channel A 24-hour sports network. We have just seen the end of round one. 
Riverside versus Diamond Creek at the Mongrook Oval of the B-grade clash. Diamond Creek chasing down the target of 150 in the final over. And so this game has come to an end and now it is time to award some points in terms of the Diamond Cr in terms of the Channel 8 Player of the Year Award, the coveted award which uh, hasn't been awarded for the last 10 seasons is now back and now it's time to see who has earned some votes. So Hados, you are in charge of giving out the votes. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, take it away. Fantastic. And look, there are some honourable mentions. Throughout the afternoon, there were some contributors there. And when you don't have a half century or more than a three wicket haul, it can be tricky to give out these sort of votes there. So there's always honourable mentions. One that comes to mind is Nathan Bragg, who didn't feature in my uh, top three there, making a quick fire 27 and hit the only uh, maximum there, which will get a sponsor for throughout the season there. Chuck, I'm sure you'll look after that one there. Um, I thought Doyle did some good work for. Riverside there with his 26 in the middle overs there, um, combined well there with Connor Gedge there for the 41 run partnership there. And I thought with the ball Dylan Badurk also did some good work there as well there. So there were three guys I just wanted to, to quickly mention there as being um, noteworthy players there. Uh, for my 3-2-1, I'm going to give one vote here to Connor Gedge there. Uh, did the job with 24 not out with the bat and got 3 for 36. A couple of those wickets you could argue were just because of the fact they're in the low order there, but also did some good fielding as well there. So um, a very worthy one vote recipient in my opinion there. Uh, the two votes I'm actually going to give to Andrew Taylor there. When you anchor the innings there in the winning side, it's always hard to ignore him, and he did a fantastic job there. Was the top scorer with 34 combined with both Wells and McDonald there. So worked well with two of the 20 year olds in the side there. So fantastic work from Taylor. He gets my two. And I think the three you had already worked out before I even started talking there, Dale Wells. Not only was he the most economical bowler with 2 for 18, but he was the quickest scoring batsman with 28 runs there and better than a runner ball. So, did a fantastic job today. Has come a long way as we talked about in the telecast there. Has used his opportunities in the T20 competitions he's been a part of to develop his game, both with bat and ball. And the fact that he was able to get the job done in this one day format was a credit to him there, so a very well uh, worthy recipient there. So just to recap the 3-2-1, two, one, 1 to Connor Gedge, 2 to Andrew Tower, and 3 to Dale Wells. Can, well, we, cut, can we cut to Lee Ward now? <laughs> <laughs> Which yes. is the same. <laughs> yes. Well, I have to say that this B-grade competition has been opened up significantly with this result. Riverside would be backing themselves to get top of the table or in first or in second place at the very least again this season and to really see a repeat of what they just went through and with this defeat the entire competition has just opened up and we're going to be seeing like a new type of way that this competition really starts to unfold as we see the other rounds and the other results but I'm afraid that that is the end of our broadcast this is Channel 8 24 Hour Sports Network. You have just watched Diamond Creek versus Riverside B grade round one at the Mungrook Oval. I am Chucker Wilson and I have been joined by Damien Hados Hayden. It's an absolute pleasure. We will catch you next week for round two. Until then, goodbye. The moon is beating on this town, on the silent streets and all around. It's crescents growing larger every time I close my eyes The burning lamp lights on Main Street on this deserted Tuesday night Are calling for a sign of life to consume their fire As the girl sits alone on a bench, she's waiting for a ride Or a moment of clarity or perhaps she is not waiting for anything at all And she's content to watch the street lights and the moon on the concrete She's been there for as long as 
years I have seen it maybe longer Maybe she has always been there as a living statue She commemorates a saint who had fallen some years past And has drifted from the spotlight and is nothing more than a shadow of a shadow It is carved with a purpose And nobody knows her destiny Not even this girl Who sits all alone on the bench under the moon And the street lights and she stares at something in the distance at this hour and the clouds are laying low on the horizon upon pillows of more clouds and the soft orange glow of the sleeping sky casts down on the sleeping earth and she will rise when the morning sun consumes the fog the soft orange glow becomes the fallen saint Hidden by the shadow of a shadow Burned by the spotlight Invisible Gone